So thank you for this session. And um, I'm very grateful that you have uh, agreed to uh, do this employability panel. And the way we will do this session is, firstly, we will have a brief introduction from, uh, from yourself. Um, we will then look at some of the questions that our, uh, our students have had. And um, we will then look at uh, the students will have some access to some pre-recorded materials. Um, and that's mainly in three uh, types of topics. So one is on finding a job in China, which is focused towards our students from China. Um, there is another session on finding a job in Saudi Arabia and a session on business intelligence. So we are looking at a lot of different um, aspects. Um, I'm, I'm sure you will probably recall how stressful it is for um, uh, for our students to get their first jobs and after completing their studies from here. So to help them better, we are uh, we are creating this event so where they can hear from you and learn from your experience. So this is what we are planning for today. Um, so what we did was we invited our students to ask some questions. And the idea was that we will take their questions um, and then we'll try to group them together into some themes. We'll try to um, get some uh, primary questions that they had, and then we can ask our panel to discuss about these. So we asked them, um, what do you want to find out? Uh, what are your concerns? What are your questions? What are your queries? And we've got quite a few questions. And if we just do a, um, a set of, uh, you know, just looking at the uh, keywords, you, you find something like this, which is quite a lot um, of topics. Um, but the core things that they wanted to know is uh, it's probably visa sponsorship for overseas students. As you may have already experienced, we do have quite a lot of overseas students. Um, and they were quite keen to understand uh, what's the um, market for information scientists, for data scientists, um, and how can they get employed in, uh, in organizations where they provide um, sponsorship. Um, at the same time, they had some questions about uh, how can we prepare for interviews? So how do we prepare? Hello, everyone. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, go uh, ahead. All right, okay. Um, well, I see that Alexandro's joined us. Um, okay, so they wanted to know about um, how do we prepare for interviews. Um, and also they had some questions about how to best reflect their CVs, best reflect their skills. So based on that, we have some questions that we would like to ask you. Uh, and the questions are some things like this. So how do we ease the transition into data science and information science? Um, how can we face the harsh, harsh experience requirements? So um, a lot of times they, there are job requirements where they're asked to um, discuss about their experience, but at the same time, the technology might not have been there in the market for so many years. So it's quite hard for students to get over this boundary. Um, especially, this is quite difficult for students with no job experience. Um, they are also asking about what are the main skills that they need to be constantly trained. So not just getting the job, but during the job, um, how can they constantly keep their skills um, updated? Um, they've asked about the interview itself. So how will the interviewer assess, assess my skills? And should I prefer for specific skills required? So if we can learn a software or something like that. Um, prospects and tips in finding good jobs in the information science industry. So that's, that's also quite a common question from students. So what we will do next is we will invite uh, one of you at a time to just provide some introduction about yourself, uh, talk a bit about um, your experience in finding jobs, um, and how you've prepared. So it's totally up to you if you have anything specific you want to say at this moment. Uh, this is more as an introduction. And then once we have this, then we can move on to um, specific questions that students have asked. So um, the, another thing that I might want to add over here is if you're not speaking, can you please mute the mic 
so that um, and when you are speaking then just unmute your mic um, so what I'll do now is I will um, invite one at a time um, and then you can uh, speak about your experience and provide a bit of introduction to um, where you are and um, what are you doing at this time okay so I've, I've got Angela on the uh, on the list of attendees uh, now. So Angela, would you like to start off your introduction? Um, I just had uh, muted you. So uh, can you um, unmute yourself and then, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this panel discussion. Um, it's my first employability event, so it's an honor. Uh, my name is Angela Macharia. I'm Kenyan. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm an alumni of the University of Sheffield. I graduated in January 2016 with a Master of Science in Information Management. Um, I currently work as a school librarian at a primary school in um, in Nairobi. Basically, it's a new school that I'm setting up a library for them before COVID happened. <laughs> and so for today, I'm here to, to speak about my experience and also to share tips on the interview process, my application process, basically my experience, because it has been a learning curve. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Angela. That's great. Um, and there's lots of uh, exciting things um, happening at your end. Uh, and hopefully, uh, things with COVID will ease, uh, ease at some point and things will move ahead much more quicker. Now. Um, uh, David, uh, would you like to? Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi. Good. Good morning, or whatever time it is that you you watch this back on the recording. Uh, my name is David. Um, it's nice to meet you all virtually. Um, and I am currently an academic liaison librarian at the University of York. I did my uh, master's degree and MA in librarianship in Sheffield in 2008 to 9, which seems like a very very long time ago now indeed. Um, but upon reflection was also an interesting time of recession and a uh, slightly volatile job market so that's that's a sort of interesting reflection for me to look back on all those those years ago um, since leaving Sheffield I've had a career up and down the country really which wasn't particularly my plan I wouldn't necessarily have thought to move around but I guess that shows how flexible sometimes you have to be in, in terms of looking for jobs um, and currently in York where I did my undergraduate degree so slightly come full circle really in terms of my uh, career is where I first thought about being a librarian and I've ended up working here so that's that's quite nice really in many ways um, and in between lots of good and bad experiences of job applications and, and interviews and, and all that goes with it really so very happy to talk about both the good and the bad experiences along the way um, back to York. That's great uh, thanks David. Um, Matt uh, would you like to uh, Sure thing. So, hi everyone. My name is Matt Carl. Um, I'm the librarian in charge of the Nottingham campus for the University of Law, which newly opened back in September. So, I'm new into role and also new into disruption uh, owing to COVID. So, this is kind of a very interesting time to start a new job. Um, I graduated from the University of Sheffield in 2014 and since then I've actually been outside of traditional librarianship. Um, I got a job um, initially teaching history in a private school which is loosely connected to librarianship but then moved into designing digital learning for a law firm in East Anglia. So my pathway to normal academic librarianship if you can classify it as that has been slightly kind of snaky but I got here eventually um, and also I just want to apologize for not having a webcam I'm on campus today but that possibly may be a benefit to all of you watching um, you get to see my profile picture instead. So that's me. <laughs> right, thank you, uh, Matt. Um, well, we have lots of experience today, so that's that's really interesting, and uh, and it it brings in a lot of experience, a lot of years in the room. 
and uh, I'm, I'm really hopeful that this will be very helpful to our students. Um, so um, let's move on to the questions. Uh, and the first question that we wanted to discuss is, and the students want to learn, is how can we ease the transition into data science or information science um, mid-career? So if you have some experience, in other fields, uh, and if you have some job experience, how can we ease this transition into um, information sciences in general? Um, so the way we will do these questions is if you just unmute yourself and just you know want to discuss about certain things, uh, please feel free to do so. I think one of the points that i would make is if you've got experience from a different sector don't be afraid to look at those skills um, and actually look at the value there because you might have done something in the past in a non-information role that actually corresponds to the job you're applying for or the job that you've just got um, and it may be that you've done things better in that non-librarian non-data science role um, in the past also i would suggest that skills or outside skills constantly refresh the world of data science and librarianship it always adds a great degree of kind of flexibility and i think that's one of the best things about our sector that we work in in that if you have something you've got for example instructional design as a result i'm now in charge of creating this digital academy for students and staff um, mainly because not that many people at the university have those design skills that I kind of picked up from the law firm. So I would if you've got experience from a different career, don't be scared to kind of flaunt it, so to speak, when you actually get into those roles because you might be bringing fresh and exciting new perspectives into it as well. That's a great point. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, David, would you like to add? Yeah, I was very much going to echo what Matt said, really. And although my route into librarianship has been somewhat traditional. I would definitely say that lots of my colleagues haven't had that, that same route and actually the experience that they bring is really, really valuable. And if I think about some of the areas in which academic librarianship is changing, actually having some skills and some experience from elsewhere might be really, really beneficial. So for example, user experience or UX is becoming a really important part of the work that we do. So gathering intelligence from our users and turning that into real change on the ground so not necessarily doing a project over many years but much much quicker more rapid change and um, so actually if people have experience in something like ux from a different industry a different background bringing that alongside other skills is a really useful thing to do so for me i think it, it can be a strength and i think you can absolutely play to that um, and really just demonstrate how your skills from a different context fit into what's being asked in that particular job. So just to echo what Matt said, really, don't be scared of that. Really view it as a strength and look at what you know about the sector and where your skills can fit into whatever changes are on the horizon in that area. Thanks, David. That's, uh, that's really interesting. So it's, it's this aspect of identifying uh, transferable skills that you can bring into other domains, other topics of um, interest. That that's that's quite key, I think, uh, in in making sure that your application stands out. So to make sure that that you communicate that you have expertise in a particular topic, and you can transfer it over to another domain or another topic. Um, that's great. Um, is there anything else anyone would like to add? To this? Uh, yes. Can I add? Uh... Sure. Yes. Yes. I would like to add something. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hi. So, yeah. Sorry about that. The connection is very bad, and uh, I was like, perfect. Okay. Great. So, uh, just to say very quickly, I had a bit of experience from the side of the uh, interviewer, uh, in which. I noticed that um, this this set of transferable skills sometimes is just a, a, about a different slang or different language between different topics. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, database systems, information systems, or uh, in my case, uh, statistics, machine learning, and a lot of other topics are usually the the, the core knowledge is the same. It's just uh, the language or the. It's really worth it. Not. Uh, 
as David was saying, not to be not to be afraid and just uh, uh, trying to to look online for a sort of a Rosetta Stone of this uh, uh, kind of slangs to understand w w what is your knowledge, how it transfer to uh, to other uh, fields. And uh, in a lot of cases, you can actually uh, easy, easily uh, enter a new field. Great point, Alessandro. Thanks. Angela, would um, you like to add? Yes. Um, I would also encourage um, our students also to think outside of your title. That is, if you're transitioning into data science, um, instead of thinking of what you did day in, day out, you can think of the projects that you've worked for, the results that you have also as an individual have been able to solve. So that gives you an easier transition to um, to transfer your skills into that um, position or career. Yeah. Great, thanks, Angela. Um, I, I'd also want to add a bit from uh, what um, Alessandro was mentioning uh, from being in the interviewer panel sometimes it um, if you if, if, if it is very clear that you've had experience in another uh, domain and if you've not made it clear in your application or if you've not made an attempt to make it clear in an application it sometimes stands out so it, it's it's something that would worry um, or that would make an interviewer think again that why haven't you really discussed that so if you do have experience somewhere else um, like we've or we've discussed now, uh, do try to make it clear over here how you can transfer that knowledge or transfer the skills. So don't hesitate to uh, not making it um, very evident. Um, thanks a lot for that. Um, we can move on to the next question. Um, so the question is, how do we face the harsh experience requirements? Um, example, years of experience, in the job description, especially for students with no job experience. So we move on to a question where um, we have students where with, without any job experience, um, where sometimes they are asked to showcase um, experience of two years worth experience or five years experience in a technology which has only been there for like four or five years. So um, it's, it's quite difficult to do that. So some of the question, students are asking questions around this topic. Uh, would anyone want to add um, from your experience on this? Yeah, I, I could speak to that, uh, Deep. So the, the reflection I was thinking about with this question was, was what is meant by experience to, to a certain degree? And, and that might seem like a, an, an obvious thing, but actually sometimes different employers will have a very different idea of what they mean by experience. Do they mean hard and fast formal job role with the experience in that area? Or actually, are they talking more about things that you've picked up elsewhere? So it might be considering actually what is meant by experience in that particular context. And I think one thing that students can do there is, is get in touch with the contact for the job advert, actually. Um, and that's something I, I've not really done myself, but actually I've, I've had it the other way around in terms of the the employer role where people have got in touch and had an informal conversation around various aspects of what is in the job description or the person specification and i think it helps both the employee that the employer rather and, and the applicant to know what the expectations are and obviously then you're not wasting your time putting in an application for something where there is a very strict rule about what they're looking for but on the other hand you might feel more encouraged and more um, ready to, to make an application where maybe there's a little bit more leeway to it. So I'd encourage people really to look at what's being asked in a bit more detail. Don't just necessarily take it as read that, okay, I haven't got two years of experience in a job, so that means I can't apply, but also be confident in, in asking those questions and getting in touch with the employer and just asking, is it worth me putting in an application for this? You know, is that the sort of thing that you're looking for from an applicant for this position? That's great. Thanks, David. Um, anyone else wanted to add on this? Um, if I can say something, I yep. mean, uh, one of the challenges us uh, graduates face is not having or having enough experience. It's such a daunting experience, I will say the least, because I've passed through that as well. 
And I will piggyback of what David just said in terms of the job description. You need to look at the job description very carefully. It can be so overwhelming. It can be some, some job description actually is so detailed. You feel so overwhelmed to go through it. And don't think of the ways how you are unqualified. Think of the experiences that you've had before. It can be small. But those little experiences, you can put it in a way that stands out. Also, uh, also in your CV, as you're writing your cover letter, you can put like uh, under spe something like under special qualification. That way, it attracts the one who's uh, reading or accepting your um, application to read that place that stands out. Um, and also, volunteer intern, volunteer intern. Um, I, I know our generation, we look for jobs in terms of want to get that salary. Think of the experience. Um, like for me, one of the things I didn't mention is that I'm a part-time lecturer and lecturing is part of my passion. And I got an experience where uh, we weren't paid as a lecturer, but I took that experience and I was able to get a lecture, a better lecturing job at a public university here in Kenya, and I'm getting paid. So that experience really helps a lot. And also do something, do something like organize a meetup um, with information professionals around you. You may be surprised of what you may learn. You may be surprised on the referrals you'll get. It's, yeah, so I think that's how to face the harsh reality in experience requirements. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. Um, yes, um, it, it's a really good idea to explore internships or um, unpaid volunteer uh, work um, and also organizing things. I think these days it's, it's a bit probably easier with social media to organize things to get people in the same room um, and to get them talking about a particular topic. And, and that also does showcase not just um, topical experience, but also leadership qualities and um, other so many other things that are, again, transferable to many other um, applications that, that you could make. Um, would anyone else want to add to this uh, conversation? I think just building on what Angela said about the CV is that you can be slightly bold, especially if you don't have that necessary experience to insert a paragraph at the end of your CV or in the middle, wherever, um, that actually explains some of the other qualities that you could bring to the job role that potentially the hiring um, manager or whoever is kind of interviewing for the position hasn't actually considered. but they actually maybe value and add value to that role in the first instance, especially if it's an entry role as well. I think in the past, a lot of the people that we've interviewed here at the University of Law, we've always looked for a bit of kind of difference to kind of what we put out necessarily, because there is that element of kind of, if you have um, a wide selection of skills or skills that we haven't realized, then it shows that you've got an element of creativity and a um, diversity as well, which is always really good. Um, and we as kind of hiring managers don't always think about when you're writing job descriptions um, and role descriptions as well. But And as well, there's a lot of content out there. So there's a lot of MOOCs. Um, there's a lot of kind of training courses that you can undertake for free on a wide range of technologies. So I know that there's the Microsoft Academy, for instance, and you have kind of five years required of Microsoft Excel, which I don't know is probably enough to kill somebody. But um, for example, you do have that uh, those training courses that you can take, and that is experience because you can then start putting those into practice yourself um, if you have those on your computer or just doing the courses online as well. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I think um, making yourself stand out is probably a good idea and, and try to showcase different ways how, how you can do that. Um, Alessandro, would you like to add as well? Yes, thanks. So from the point of view of the interviewer, uh, what I can say is that in a lot of cases for uh, kind of specific uh, uh, positions in which you, uh, really specific uh, set skills is needed. It's almost impossible to find the perfect fit. And what we try to do is to understand uh, whether the person has the abilities to quickly learn. 
So in, uh, in the interview process, it's important uh, not to fake your knowledge, but uh, to show that uh, there is a background that allows to quickly learn uh, that required skills. Uh, so it's, it's more important to show uh, the ability to, to think, uh, the ability to have a kind of a creative way to approach a problem rather than covering all the skill set required. That's a great point. Um, I was also going to add uh, to this uh, point on uh, from an employee, employers or from the interviewer's perspective, uh, it's to see this transferability of what you know or what you can apply to something else, how quickly you can learn and adapt. Uh, and sometimes providing some examples on how you've done that in the past. So even if it is about organizing a small uh, workshop or a small event can actually showcase that you have the ability to do things quickly to to get on board to another topic and things like that. Uh, David, did you want to add to this? Yes, I was just um, reflecting on a point that, that Angela made really um, and, and adding about that employer perspective that a job description can be very, very long and obviously those are the things the employer has determined are, are relevant and uh, necessary for that particular job. Think about when the the recruiters, the people doing the selection process, have to go through the applications. They may have many dozens, even hundreds of applications to look through. You need to make their job really, really easy for them to pick out how you match those criteria, potentially very uh, sort of numerous criteria that they have developed. So try. I, I always find it valuable when people repeat the language back that was used in the original job description. So if it says it in a particular way, try to use the same terminology, the same phrasing, because then if I'm looking through for that item of, of interest, it's very obvious to me, I can see it and I can tick it off that list. Whereas if you've written maybe a really very eloquent paragraph about why you meet that criteria, but it's not quite so obvious that it's the same terminology or the same area that you're talking about, it's a lot more work for me as as the person reading that application to identify that. So it's I don't think you should ever think that people wouldn't read what you've written. Of course, they would do. But you've got to just make it as easy as possible for them to see where your skills fit with the requirement that they're asking for. And particularly with this experience one, you know, look at the way that they've written um, what they're asking for in terms of experience and try to reflect that in the way that you write your answer. That's great. Uh, thanks, David. Um, so, yes, do do think about the, the people who are going to read your CVs, your applications, and try to think from their perspective how you can make it stand out even more, uh, make things much clearer and, and quicker, uh, and use these kind of pointers to, uh, to explain how you fit in. Um, that's great. Thanks a lot um, uh, for, for these points. Uh, we can move on to the next question. And the question is, um, what are the main skills that you need to be constantly trained? So this is not just about uh, getting a first job, but also about uh, moving on from there. Uh, what can you keep building constantly to, uh, to make yourself more employable, more attractive to potential employers? Would anyone want to add to that? um to answer the question forgive me if i start to wax lyri lyrical about digital literacy skills but it is becoming a watchword for this um century and also due to the current crisis i think i've seen a lot of my colleagues wake up to the fact that potentially their digital skills um are kind of not necessarily as up to scratch as they thought they were and that could cover a wide range of stuff such as email and file management which I am very guilty of at times when we're getting deluges of emails coming through all the way up to kind of using Microsoft Flow or other kind of coding applications and that's the more extreme end but it's digital literacy is something which I don't think is going to go away and if anything the kind of digital university as a thing is kind of probably not too far away on the horizon and so Covering those are, in my opinion, is really valuable. And JISC 
um, is a very useful resource. So if you go onto their website, there's lots of information that you'll find in terms of developing your digital capability. There is something called the digital discovery tool. This isn't an advert for GIST, by the way. Um, but the discovery tool allows you to kind of benchmark yourself and kind of um, the characteristics that they've defined. And it's quite a useful way of just kind of self-analyzing your skills and kind of highlighting the one ones that need to kind of be trained going forwards as well. So that would be my advice, would be focus on digital um, as a priority at the minute. Thanks, Matt. That's really interesting. Um, so if you, if you do have um, any resources that you could point our students to, that would be great. Uh, maybe after this session, if you can send us an email, um, I, I will also try and find all of the resources that you mentioned, but um, that would be great if you can share that sure. with us as well. Sure thing. Thanks, Matt. Um, David, would you like to add? Yes. Um, so I think Matt's absolutely right. Digital literacy skills and, and associated areas are really key for a number of different roles. It's, it's a huge aspect of what I do um, in terms of my my day-to-day -day role, both directly with students, but also through academic staff as well. So I think that's that will be an area that only grows um, whether or not we go back to normal times, whatever those will look like in the future. I think it will will grow because so many people have realised over the last few months the importance of that area in a way that maybe they didn't before. I would also just add that I think interpersonal skills or what is quickly becoming known as relationship management is such a key skill to, to keep yourself up to date with. And that might sound obvious, of course, you, you know, you've got to get on with people, but it's a little bit more than that as well. It's about being able to build long term relationships. And, and that is so much a part of what my role is all around. Um, it's it's not just going in and delivering something and that's the end of it. It's an ongoing conversation and keeping a kind of two way dialogue with the people that we work with across the university, making sure that we stay relevant to what it is that they're doing. Um, and putting ourselves in their shoes rather than just, well, the library does this and that's what we do and we're not changing what we do. Actually, the institution around us changes very, very quickly. So we need to have a mindset to be agile, to change as, as change comes to us, no, no more so than at the moment, of course. So I think having those, those skills to be able to work with people, to bring people together, to manage relationships is really, really important. And to be able to demonstrate that in applications, I think, is is really key as well. I'd be very surprised if it didn't come up in most job descriptions for academic libraries. Um, but even if it doesn't, I think actually being able to, to demonstrate that in an interview situation is really important. You can learn a technical skill um, whenever. You know, you may not have done it before, but you can demonstrate that you can learn it. It's much harder to to show that you can just learn people skills. You have to be able to demonstrate some um, some empathy in that area, I think. So a technical skill can be learned, a people skill is much harder to do that. So if you can show that from the off, then I think that's a really good prospect. Great point, David. Um, yes, it's, the, um, it's also the um, soft skills that, that are quite important and, and becoming quite important as well especially when many things are starting to merge together. Um, so that's, that's something quite, quite useful to keep, uh, keep developing um, throughout, throughout our careers. I think that's, that's something that will always be relevant, um, at least for now, it looks like. Um, anyone else wanted to add anything on this topic? Angela? Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, some of the skills that I think that need to be constantly trained not even now but also for the future one is creative thinking skills um as a graduate or as a or as an individual who's looking for a job you need to demonstrate that you you're using your resources creatively um not coming up with excuses uh but use your creative i mean your creative skills to serve the purpose that is needed for that particular job you're applying for or the experiences you've had so far the second one is communication and emotional intelligence. Um, we will need that now. We still need that now and also in the future as well. It's important. In, emotional intelligence is important. First of all, to read oneself and that will enable one or you to read the people around you. And that way it will enable you to communicate better. 
and therefore understanding your craft for a communication strategy. And then the third one is values. Um, the way you think, feel, or act need to be, uh, you need to choose your values carefully. For example, integrity. You need to demonstrate um, how integral you are also to oneself and also to your teammates and also how, how you've related during uh during the time you have you are in school as well also diligence and hard work whatever your value is um that needs to be consistent it's a skill that for me i think needs to be constantly trained yeah so oh, that's that's quite a lot of really interesting points uh, and sometimes it's hard to uh, remember them or hard to consider them when when we are looking at applications when we are looking at uh, job descriptions because so many of these points that, that all of you have mentioned are not really in specifications they aren't in job descriptions and and it's something that that you would want to see in applicants or in applications but at the same time um, if someone's going down the list of requirements uh, it, it's not really mentioned like you have to show that you are uh, you have integrity or you have to show that uh, you have um, these kind of emotional intelligence uh, and you have you can connect with people but all of these in some ways you have to make them um, perceivable through your application or your interviews so it's it's some really good points for for all of us to think about so thank you all for uh, for mentioning them um, unless there's any more to add uh, maybe we can move on to the next question um, and the question is, how will the interviewer assess my skills? Um, should I prepare for specific skills required? Uh, for example, learning a software. Um, and I think um, some of us over here have experience of being interviewers. Um, and I suppose all of us have experience of being interviewed. Um, so um, maybe we can start off this discussion by looking at the first uh, part of the question. So. How will interviewers assess my skills? Um, so is there anyone who would like to start off the discussion? Um, okay, no one so far. So let, let's let's think about um, your experience as an interviewer um, and try to, maybe you could try to discuss about how you would look at applications when you see them in terms of skills or um, specific kind of requirements and how would you assess um, what, what are your views? What do you think from your experience or um, from your field? Um, yeah, I can, I can speak to that deep. So um, thinking about both my experiences as an interviewee, but also an interviewer, um, I've seen a range of different, um, I guess, methodologies that, that are taken in an interview situation. Um, so for my current role, the scenario was a role play. Uh, so we had the, the interview, but rather than doing a presentation, um, it was a situation to pretend that you were having a conversation with an academic um, and you were trying to convince them of something that they didn't want to do, essentially. So thrown in at the deep end of a relationship where you, you're battling against um, a particular issue. Um, even stranger because the academic who was supposed to be there was on strike on that particular day. So it was somebody pretending to be an academic who was pretending to be in that situation. So nice, nice kind of removed um, situation all around, really. So that, that did actually work. I mean, I, I was very nervous about it. I hate doing role play. Um, I did it as part of the degree, in fact, at Sheffield, and I didn't enjoy it then, and I didn't enjoy it in the interview, but it was extremely effective. Um, it really, when I spoke to my um, my boss and the other members of the interview panel afterwards, when I, I started the job, th they spoke so highly about the, the experience it shows them, rather than just the traditional kind of interview questions. So I think although it can be scary when you're you're given that information ahead of the interview and you said right this is going to be the the skill that we want to see or the test if you like for the interview try to embrace it because they have chosen it for a reason they're looking for something from you that they maybe aren't going to get through the questions that that they 
they would ask in, in a traditional interview process. So look at it as an alternative opportunity to demonstrate who you are and what value you, you bring in that particular situation. On the flip side, I have also had scenarios where it's a completely wrong fit for the the test and the job don't go together at all. So um, situations where they've asked the applicant to do a presentation despite the job not involving any form of for, of public speaking, anything like that. So even in those situations where you can think that to me doesn't seem like a good fit, it doesn't feel like there's a connection between those things. Try to think about what the employer is looking for in that scenario. There must have been a reason for that choice, even if it's not one that's immediately apparent. Are they just looking for a confident individual? Are they looking for somebody who's a good communicator, albeit in a different way in the role? So just, again, try to put yourself in the employer's shoes and think about what are they actually looking for here? Why have they chosen this approach? And how can I tailor my own approach to fit what they're looking for? Thanks, David. Um, Angela, would you like to add? Um, I'd like to talk on the part of the interviewer because I've not been an interviewee just yet. <laughs> um, I would like to talk in terms of the telephone interview and maybe video conferencing interview. Um, I remember there was a situation where um, I had a telephone interview and I've never had one before and it was nerve wracking, but it was also a learning experience. And from then I picked up a few points uh, such that when I had another telephone interview from a different company and applied it, in, I was able to convey myself well, I was able to communicate well, I was able to outline the skills that are fit for that job. Also, um, it's it's a learning process. And also for the video interview, interview um, there was an interview I went through where um, I was not prepared it would be a video interview such that there's a panel and there's also like a video of another person in another country interviewing you as well. So it was nerve wracking, but at the same time, it was a learning experience for me. And one of the um, pointers I could point out is that always prepare, 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 prepare yourself. Um, uh, look at the interview questions, what they may ask, uh, make sure that you're dressed well, just prepare yourself. That's basically what I would um, give advice to. Because the interview, the interviewer assesses many skills while at it. They might uh, assess how you communicate, how you answer questions under pressure, how you present yourself. Uh, so those are the tips that, um, those are the skills that the, the interview assesses. Uh, that's some really great points, uh, David Angela. If Thanks I can add something, that. please. Sure. Yeah, very quickly. I I, I really I agree with Angela on this. It's uh, uh, doing interview uh, not in person is a lot harder. And actually, from our statistics, we can see that it's actually when there is a mix, like some candidates come in person, they have a higher probability to be hired. So it is really a disadvantage to be online. So I guess now with uh, the current situation, we are all in the same page and that's good, <laughs> the same opportunities. But anyway, the, my point is um, that it's it's really hard uh, when we are not in person body language feedback from the other people to see if uh, uh, your question, your answer is kind of uh, satisfying or if you need to uh, try to engage a bit with the with the interviewer by asking oh does this answer your question and you want me to expand uh, not try just to talk for 20 minutes you know and then it's a bit awkward that they they cannot interrupt you they cannot show you with the body language that it, it's enough you know <laughs> so it's um, it's really important to try to to give uh, uh, the room uh, uh, space to uh, kind of uh, guide the the length to the answers and also the the, the dialogue to, to to make it a sort of communication, not just throwing uh, all you know in in one go. Thanks, Alessandro. Uh, David, would you like to add to that? 
Yeah, I was just um, reflecting again on, on Angela's point around what the interviewer is going to be doing. So the questions they ask you and the approach that they're taking. Um, it sounds like a really obvious thing, but make sure that you have saved a copy somewhere of the original job description, the person specification, your application, because those are the things they're going to have on the table in front of them um, to refer back to. And those are the things that if all goes to plan, the questions should be based on those things as well. And of course, the job advert existed online after it's closed, it's not available anymore. So if you haven't saved it somewhere, it makes your job a lot harder to actually go back and prepare your answers to the different areas that have been asked about. So make sure that you save everything um, as best that you can, because it makes your preparation a lot easier down the line. And I would also say in terms of questions, I mean, you, you can largely anticipate some of the questions that they're going to ask. You never can know all of them. But just go back to that person's specification and try and think about what are the likely issues that are going to come up here. You know, if the, the essential criteria is that you've got to know about a certain skill, it's very likely going to be a question on that interview in some form or another. So can you prepare a couple of examples in advance, which you might be able to choose from to kind of pick the, um, the best one to fit that answer? And in terms of preparation, try and think about who's on the interview panel. Most of the time you do get told who that's going to be um, and you can try and do a little bit of research on what their roles are, what their interests are. If you've got somebody from the wider institution but not from the library, as, as I would have done on, on my interview, um, try and find out a bit about their background and think what questions are they likely to be asking from uh, a different perspective to the library. So do as much preparation as you can and give yourself time to do that in the process. Thanks, David. Um, really good points coming out about uh, not just thinking from yourself as as the uh, as the person being interviewed, but also the person who is in interviewing you, uh, doing a bit of research on on people who will be in the panel, um, as well as trying to think from their from their perspective. What can you make stand out? What can you make clearer? So, so these are some really interesting points. Uh, so thank you for raising them. Um, is there anything else you would want to add or maybe, maybe we can move on to the next question then? I'd just probably point out that um, presentations are usually a very common way, um, especially in the academic sector, um, of assessing skills. Um, my advice there would be if you can the interviewers will probably have seen about five presentations depending on how many people they've uh, interviewed that particular day so if there are, is a new way of presenting that information using alternatives then definitely use that or alternatively try and avoid death by powerpoint so often people think for an interview they need all singing all dancing slides um, with animations on and really you want it to be as basic and as simple as possible but still hitting the points that you want to make um, and I think it's a key skill to actually be able to synthesize information effectively and by doing that on your slides when you're presenting um, that you'll be already covering one of the skills off without actually saying anything which is a really useful and to the second point in terms of preparing for specific skills hopefully you would have got that in the job description um, but if you haven't used that technology before or you feel you're a bit rusty so if there's for example i had a job interview where i had a test on using word excel and powerpoint which is exciting um, i hadn't used excel in the way that they were expecting me to use it um, for, it must have been going on five ten years um, but don't get hung up on the fact that if you can't do something or you feel like those kind of skills tests are going the wrong way and um, don't let that kind of disrupt your flow especially when you move on to the interview phase because um, often those tests are there as kind of just kind of an inkling into your kind of skills with those technology and at the end of the day skills can be trained whereas if your kind of personality and your softer skills which are arguably harder to acquire than technology or technological skills um, then you should be fine yeah just uh, to add on the point about presentations as well i think try and consider what they're looking for in that presentation are they primarily trying to understand your knowledge in which case i think matt's point around synthesizing information is really key um, to make sure you're putting it across succinctly 
but are they actually more looking for your ability, your ability to stand up in front of a group and to present? And a good indicator of that might be that the, the presentation isn't just to the interview panel. If you've got a presentation to a room full of people from that institution, partly they're looking to understand how you can cope in a larger situation with a larger group of people. Um, and certainly I know for a lot of the, the interviews where I've, I've helped as part of the, the recruitment, yes we want people to stand up and say something where they demonstrate some knowledge of course you you can't say something completely irrelevant but a large part of what we're looking for is would we have confidence to put that person in front of a room of either academics or students or colleagues and know that they would be able to present accurately with confidence and and with ability so i think it, it is of course about your knowledge as well but some of that comes out in the interview questions use the presentation as an opportunity to show that you have that skill and that you are confident in delivering in that way. That's great. Um, thanks for those points. Um, uh, and yes, uh, presentations, they, they can eventually end up being quite boring, but the way you present it, uh, the way you can show that you, have, you are confident in what you're talking and you're confident in front of a room full of people, that's, that's quite... Um, that's quite key. Uh, and like you mentioned earlier, um, I think David, you mentioned that, that you can get back to the, the, the recruiters and ask them for clarification. You can ask them if you are not sure who's going to be there in the room when you're presenting, you could ask your, your recruiters on details about that. Most often they are provided, but if, if it's not provided, then it's a good opportunity to go back and ask them. Um, thanks for that. Uh, really good answers, really interesting things for all of us to keep thinking about. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next question, um, which is the final question for today. Uh, prospects and tips in finding good jobs in the information or data science industry. Um, this comes a, a quite, quite open-ended, I suppose, but, but I think um, students are looking at how can they um, understand what are the prospects, where can they get a bit more information, what tips would you suggest, what can they do to find out more about vacancies and things like that. So if you would like to talk a bit about that from your experience. I think certainly when I graduated, there was two places that I went to for finding a job within the information and data sciences industry. So the first was um, through my membership through SILIP. So LS, LIS JobNet is a great resource because that will list all of the library jobs available. Um, and that will have a wide variety of roles in both the academic sector, the kind of uh, school library sector as well as other stuff further afield and that was always a useful place to go to as well as any of the discussion boards um, and interest groups that you can be members of i always found some of the helpful um, threads that used to talk about kind of preparing for job interviews so there's a real wealth of information on there and it is a really good place just to contact and get in touch with other librarians and other sectors um, they're usually more than happy to help in terms of giving friendly advice about um, what the prospects are and kind of how you should best approach a role. And then the other place that I used is LinkedIn. So having a LinkedIn profile is uh, essentially a hyper gateway into the world of employment. And on there, you have the job section, obviously, which has got all the good um, job searching features on there. Um, I always found that LinkedIn managed to get me paired up with a recruitment agent and if you get a recruitment agent then even though they are seen as a bit of the devil sometimes um, they are useful because it almost takes some of the pressure of the application process off for you you still do have to create your CV and covering letter but the way that they utilize it and approach firms um, does take some of that kind of impetus from you and makes it a little bit easier but LinkedIn also has a great selection of articles that are authored by leading people in the field and you can obviously follow different institutions and that's vital for research as well if you do get an interview into the organization its culture and any key individuals on there as well yeah another useful um, job board particularly for um, academic library jobs is jobs.ac.uk 
Um, so that has university jobs really across all different areas of, of what the institutions do. But there are particular categories for library and for information jobs. And you can sign up for weekly email um, digests of, of those job adverts. So that's really worth doing. Um, I'm not hunting for a job, but I still get them now because I find it interesting to see what roles are out there and what kind of uh, things are changing in, in what are being asked about in, in jobs is quite an interesting thing just to, to keep up to date with. Um, so I definitely sign up to those and in particular sign up to there's more of an academic category and there's more of a support role category. But actually, I'd find it valuable to sign up to both of those, um, if only because sometimes employers choose the wrong one. Um, so they've gone for the academic one when actually it was a support role. But sometimes it's just useful to see other jobs as well and, and get a bit of a wider perspective on it. So I definitely say that jobs to ACL UK is a, a really useful source for library jobs as well. Thanks, David. Thanks, Matt. Um, anyone else wanted to add to this? Okay, no, not many more um, ideas. But uh, I, I do find LinkedIn to be quite interesting. Uh, it seems to be quite a lot of uh, agree with uh, David discussions. Um, Angela, um, you're you're muted now. Would you like to unmute? Uh, I'm sorry about that. Really sorry. <laughs> um, I'm one of the. I want to agree with David um, on looking at other roles which are out there. Um, sometimes it's good to be on the know-how on the skills that are currently being asked for in a job description or in a certain position. That way, you you may be able to work on those skills or even go to school for it so that's one of the tips that i will i wanted to echo as well also um volunteering and internship i can't stress that enough because as much as it gives you experience it also you may never know where you intern or where you volunteer there might just be a position that is vacant and you might be called in um so it um so those two are really really important yeah. that's great um thanks angela um david matt that's really good ideas on how our students can keep um keep tracking what's out there um and also uh, looking for volunteer opportunities and and looking for ideas where they can learn skills, um, even if it doesn't necessarily always involve the aspect of payment, uh, but the experience that you can gain from there um, is quite valuable. Um, so I think, um, right, so I think we've already covered quite a lot of our, uh, well, we've, we've covered all the questions that we wanted to cover today. And we've, um, in addition to that, I think we've ended up learning a lot from your experience uh, and also covered quite a lot more topics than what I thought we would be covering earlier on. So this has been really, really interesting. Um, is there anything else you would like to add to this? Maybe something that we didn't get a chance to discuss? Uh, yeah, just one thing really, I suppose, that slightly links to the last question, but maybe a more general point, is, is thinking about what's important to you when you're hunting for jobs. Um, and obviously, that's an easy thing for somebody to say when you're in a job. It's a little bit more difficult to say when you're looking for your first role. But um, when I've thought about career planning um, in, in more recent years, it's it's less around where do I want to be and more around what is important to me in terms of jobs that I'm looking for. So, for example, are you willing to relocate? Are you willing to commute to a job or do you want to be within walking distance of that job? Are you willing to look outside of your immediate interests at something uh, broader? Do you have family commitments that you have to, to think around? So for each of you, there'll be different questions and different issues that are important. But it's very helpful when you're hunting for jobs to have answers to those questions. So be quite reflective about what it is that you're looking for. What are the areas of interest, but also what are the the boxes to tick almost? If, if you had your ideal situation, what would that be and sort of work backwards from there um, and a, yes ideal situation isn't necessarily the one that's out there but it, it helps to know what that looks like so that if you see it you can recognize it 
That's a great point. Uh, thanks, David. So, so also thinking about what you want out of it as well to consider your needs um, as well as the, the potential employer's needs. Um, thanks for that. Um, unless there's anything else to discuss, um, I'd, I'd really want to. Oh, Angela, do you want to mention anything? Um, I wanted to add uh, of all these questions, it all leads to attitude. The attitude you have towards what you're seeking for, the positions that you're seeking for, depends with you. So, for example, if you look, uh, if you come across a job, a job description or a position, and you think like, ah, oh, I'm not qualified, um, just it's all about attitude. How you think that you're not qualified may actually think may actually be maybe you're not qualified but if you put your right mindset in a way that it's positive and um assess your skills uh by with the skills that the job descriptions has outlined for you you may be surprised that you can you live and get a call back to the interview the interview and the interviewer knows what he or she is doing so if they need more details in respect to your experience they'll ask so it's it all stems to attitude out of all these questions it all stems to attitude for me yeah. that's really good um really interesting and, and really helpful um so uh, thanks a lot for that um angela david matt it's been really interesting uh thank you for taking the time uh in your busy lives uh, and thank you for providing all of this valuable advice for our students. I'm sure they will learn a lot from this and I'm sure they will take it forward to their uh, next stages in their career. Uh, hopefully at some point they will be back in, in this kind of session uh, and hopefully at some point uh, you will want to agree to come back as well and uh, talk a bit more about your experience 